This is Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days. This afternoon, a salute to the quiz kids, and I'd like to uh, reminisce for a little bit about uh, Sundays in the 1940s. We spent a lot of time in the living room in those days. We did at our house. A red oriental-style rug with fringe all around covered the floor. Against one wall was a long brown mohair sofa. Next to it was a matching brown mohair easy chair. On the arms and the back of the sofa the, and the easy chair, there were little lace doilies. They were known as antimacassars, and they were held in place by straight, straight pins, which seldom did the job. Between the chair and the sofa stood a large floor lamp with a giant lampshade resting on a brass-type stem supported at the bottom by a base of green onyx. Opposite the lamp in the other corner of our living room stood the most important piece of furniture in our house. It was the radio, a zenith console radio with a flickering green eye. My mother sat at one end of the sofa, paging through the latest issue of Good Housekeeping magazine. My dad was in the easy chair reading the Sunday edition of the Tribune. My brother was playing with toy soldiers on and around the floor lamp, and I was on the floor in front of the zenith working on a jigsaw puzzle. And we were all listening to the radio. Some great shows on radio on Sundays in those good old days of the 1940s. After dinner, we tuned into, of course, Jack Benny and Fred Allen and Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, the Fitch Bandwagon, the Manhattan Merry-Go-Round, and, and Take It or Leave It. And before dinner, in the afternoon, we listened to The Shadow, Nick Carter, Master Detective, True Detective Mysteries, Quick as a Flash, and The Quiz Kids. The Quiz Kids. You know, at the time, I didn't think they were so great. In fact, I hated it when the Quiz Kids came on, because for me, it was like being in school and not knowing the answers. Quiz Kids always gave me an inferiority complex. Naturally, my folks always enjoyed the broadcast. They would make sure we tuned in every week and would always comment on how smart those youngsters were and how proud their parents must be. And then, of course, they'd give me that look, a look that said, So, how come you're not a Quiz Kid? Nuts, I thought. Who wants to be a Quiz Kid? They probably have to study from early morning till late at night. Never have time for fun, never have time to play with the other kids. And what do they get out of it? A war bond to use for their future education. More school. Not me. I don't want to be a quiz kid. I want to be a newspaper copy boy like uh, Jimmy Olsen and work on the Daily Planet and cover stories with Clark Kent and Lois Nate Lane. That's what I wanted to be. Not a quiz kid. Not on your life. I must admit that secretly I did admire Joel and uh, Ruthie and Pat and Lonnie and, and the others. Of course, they really weren't my intellectual equal but they did represent the kids of America, and if the grown-ups were surprised that any kids could know so much and be so smart, well, I figured that was one for our side. So I listened every Sunday with my family and the rest of the country, and I will even admit that I did enjoy the program, especially on those rare occasions when one of those smart Alex missed a question. Those were the days... And those days are brought to life in a wonderful new book entitled Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids by a quiz kid herself, Ruth Duskin Feldman. She wrote a terrific book, and it's uh, hot off the press. It's just brand spanking new, and uh, we have one of the very first copies in our studio this afternoon. And we're also very fortunate to have with us the author of Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids. Ruth Duskin Feldman, welcome to Those Were the Days. Thank you, Chuck. It's nice to be with you. And Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids. Well, you see one of them <laughs> sitting before you right now. Good. You turn out very nicely. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think you did, too. Are you the, thank you. Are you one of the, are you the only Quiz Kid who ever wrote a book about the Quiz Kids? As far as I know, mm. yes. Uh, I think there's only been one other book written before about the Quiz Kids, and that was called The Quiz Kids. It was uh -huh. written back in 1947 by Roby Hickok, now Roby Hickok Kessler, lives in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who was then the assistant program director of the show. See all the information we're getting just rolling right off, tripping off the tongue of Ruth Duskin Feldman. Now, I'm going to call you Ruth Duskin for the Quiz Kid portion of the show, and I'll call you Ruth Feldman from... For other portions of the show. Oh, I'm going to have a split personality <laughs> by the time I get out of here. Well, I think many of the quiz kids did have split personalities, uh, or at least their personalities changed somewhat over the years, uh, going through the, uh, uh, the book and uh, seeing how some of them used uh, to very good advantage uh, the things that they learned while being on the quiz kids show. I think all the kids were very bright youngsters, and the quiz kids program actually 
brought out their special talents. And as I could see in your case and in Lon Lundy's and in many other cases, the uh, the kids were challenged to move into other fields uh, to learn about other things so that they could be a little more versatile on the show and not just mm-hmm. be the one who answers the music questions or the math questions or whatever. Well, you really had to in order to stay competitive because if you were stuck in one field forever, you were not going to remain on the show year after year Mm -hmm. after year. The regulars were the people who had not only a specialty but general information Mm -hmm. and were able to keep up with other people's Mm -hmm. fields as well. Now, the Quiz Kids first started on radio as a replacement for Alec Templeton. Right. He was a blind pianist, and uh, Quiz Kids went on in... June of 1940 mm-hmm. as a summer replacement. Um, the, the very few sponsors had been, in fact, no sponsors had been willing to give that show a chance because they said that nobody wanted to listen to smart kids. It would make their kids look dumb. I could understand that. <laughs> and, uh, finally, Louis Cowan, who was the originator of the Quiz Kids program, mm-hmm. was able to get this spot as a uh, Alka-Seltzer weight agency were willing to take a chance on it as a replacement program for the summer. And, of course, it went over very big, the first program, and the rest is history. It sure is. Now, how, when, when was your first appearance on the Quiz Kids? My first appearance was in November of 1941, about a year and a half or so after the show went on the air. And you were on for uh, nine years, weren't you? Yes, from mm-hmm. the age of seven to 16. 16 was when you had to graduate. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was there, no longer a spot. Did you outgrow the desk, is that it? Or was yeah, just... I guess so. <laughs> Did you did you get a uh, touch on television at all with your uh, Yes, just a little bit. I appeared on the radio 146 times and on television 11 times. Television came in around 1949. It started locally here in Chicago mm-hmm. and then went on a kind of a mini network setup uh, mm-hmm. in 1950, which was the year I graduated. Now, aside from special uh, trips and uh, appearances with the Quiz Kids on other shows or the, uh, where they would travel to another city, Basically, the show was anchored in Chicago for all those right. years, right? But I should say, incidentally, that the show did eventually um, spread on television over mm-hmm. the whole country. This, these were mm-hmm. the years when television itself was in its infancy, and the Quiz yes. Kids kind of grew with it. And I was off the show already by the time it really became big on television. But um, after the... Uh, even in the earlier years, in the uh, radio years, there would sometimes be regional Quiz Kids programs um, after the war, and they would fly in the winners from those regional mm-hmm. shows into Chicago to be on oh, the network show. Mm-hmm. And then another way that other people got to be on the show who did not live in Chicago was that during the war particularly, we traveled all over the country. And I was one of a group of four or five who would travel around from city to city on war bond tours. And sometimes in those cities there would be contests and there would be a quiz kid chosen for that city who would be on our panel and compete with us as a guest for that particular appearance. How did you, as a quiz kid, uh, uh, like the the interloper from whatever city uh, uh, you were at uh, appearing on the panel? Well, it didn't bother me. I mean, first of all, <laughs> they were not going to be able to come back the next time. Oh, you know, I maybe see. some of your listeners might not remember how the show worked, so perhaps well, I should explain okay, that good. at this point. There would be a panel of five children who would answer questions that were sent in by listeners, and the top scorers, the top three scorers, would come back the next week. Mm -hmm. The other two would be replaced by new faces, either people who had never been on the show before or sometimes people who had done pretty well were recalled and given another chance. And uh, so when we went from city to city, those quiz kids for a day were not going to be able to come back the next week because we would not be in their city the next week. So they were really just guest quiz kids. Uh uh So no threat at all to to the other... Quartet, right? Right. <laughs> and, of course, the uh, chief quizzer was Joe Kelly, and he uh, went with the uh, program all, all oh, the yes. time to the... Uh, yes, he was a songs. very beloved personality, and uh, it's an inter- interesting story how he happened to become the chief quizzer. Joe Kelly was a man with a third-grade education. He had dropped out of school to uh, go on the road with minstrel shows. He was very musical, and uh, to support his widowed mother. And when they first started the Quiz Kids program, they were casting about for just the right quiz master, and they tried out people like um, 
Clifton Utley and Clifton Fadiman and university professors, lecturers, mm -hmm. writers, and they all bombed. They were terrible because they were just too erudite and they were not good with the kids. And finally, in desperation, the Wade Agency suggested Joe Kelly, who was reading the comic strips to children mm -hmm. on morning radio and also was the uh, leader of the National Barn yes, Dance, uh -huh. the MC of the National mm -hmm. Barn Dance, uh, kind of a corn pone Hoosier from Indiana. And um, he turned out to be wonderful with the kids, although he needed an awful lot of coaching on the answers <laughs> to the questions. Well, you can hear. We've listened to many of the Quiz Kid programs, and you can hear where uh, you... The, one of the kids gives him the answer, and you can just visualize him looking at the words on the card that he has and saying they gave him an answer that sounds like it might fit, but it isn't exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. they gave more or whatever. Yeah, if it wasn't on the and, card, he yeah, was he lost. <laughs> <laughs> but he really was wonderful, and he did enjoy the kids. And, uh, yes, he did. He had a marvelous personality, and he really encouraged the kids yeah. and made them feel at home, made them feel relaxed so that they could do their best. We could do our best. Yeah. Um, and sometimes he used to fool around and tease us by pretending to show us the cards before mm -hmm. the show and then mm -hmm. grabbing them away before he could get a look. Well, happened. I don't think there was one of the other people you mentioned, uh, uh, Clifton Utley or Clifton Fadiman or any of those uh, educators or educated, highly educated people. I don't think any one of them would ever have felt comfortable telling a group of youngsters to put on their thinking caps, yes. right? <laughs> or he is, would say, yes, sir, am I ever dumb? Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't afraid to admit he was wrong, uh -huh. which is something that uh, some teachers might benefit well, from learning. Well, you see... I, a lot of this is uh, is mentioned in your book, Ruth. And as I was, uh, uh, I had the privilege of reading uh, a number of uh, early chapters some time ago, but I read through the book uh, last uh, this last week as I got the, an early copy here. And uh, the thing that that interested me very much was that uh, Joe Kelly's warmth that really came through, and how how warm and friendly he was. And and I don't think anybody could have been uh, better suited. For the, yes, for he the was program. chosen yeah. as best quiz, mast, quiz master in the mm -hmm. nation. I believe it was twice mm -hmm. in uh, listeners' polls by Radio mm -hmm. Mirror magazine. As Very I, beloved. As I think about his role on the Quiz Kids, I think about, uh, uh, and this is going to sound a little silly in the beginning, I think about uh, the Cisco Kid and Poncho. I think about uh, uh, maybe the Green Hornet and Cato. Mm -hmm. And I think about uh, uh, Wild Bill Hickok and uh, Jingles. Or whoever the the sidekicks, the, sidekick. the sidekicks are never. Uh, uh, now this is not derogatory for Joe Kelly. They're never real bright, and they always have to ask the questions to get the answer from, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the main person on the program, and and they took the role really. They were asking questions that the listeners kind of felt. Well, I'm a little. I, I don't want to appear that I'm so dumb that I don't know right. that. See. Yeah, the listener could so, identify. Yeah, with Joe they Kelly. could identify with Joe Kelly because they, if he didn't know, they he, they ah, they breathe a sigh of relief. I mean, I can remember saying, "Well, Joe Kelly doesn't even know that. How do you expect <laughs> me to know that?" You know, and my father shaking his head saying, "You, you know, comic books and the radio. That's all you ever want." <laughs> right. And of course, that that role for Joe Kelly was very carefully mm -hmm. built into the show. I mean, he was obviously a lot smarter oh, than sure, he seemed yeah. to be or pretended to be. They used to do the same thing with comedians who would guest on the show, like mm -hmm. Jack Benny, Fred Allen, mm -hmm. all of them, Bob Hope, they all pretended to be absolutely stupid. Like, I think Fred Allen had a line um, that his IQ was so low that it had roots on it. <laughs> and, and Jack Benny joked around about uh, not ever having been able to read a book because the steps of the Waukegan Library where he grew up were too high, <laughs> that kind of thing. But they were a lot smarter than they pretended to be. Those shows were always very entertaining. And, and Ruth, we have, uh, we have some really nice sounds from our collection, and part of which came from your collection. I remember you gave us a, uh, a big stack of uh, 78 RPM discs. Now, did they give you a copy of each show you were on or selected no, shows? No, I think we or? had to buy them. You had I to buy them? I think we bought the records if we wanted them, uh, yes. Somebody was, uh, the kids were getting a bond, and then they... they uh, they hit you for another couple of bucks to buy a record. Of this well, show. if we wanted them, yes. Yeah. It was those were those uh, big old breakable seventy-eight uh, RPM oh, records. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And in fact, I uh, think we first got acquainted because I brought them to you because one of them had broken, right. and my husband said, "You better get these on tape <laughs> before we lose them all." Well, there's and one. So you taped them for yeah, me, which right. I appreciate. Well, we're glad to do it because we're glad to increase our library of the archives of radio. In fact, one of them was very, very difficult to restore. A Bing Crosby appearance on the uh, that was quiz the broken kit. one. That was the broken one, and we've got that this afternoon. And uh, I'll say it later, but I want to say it now. Our friend Carl Pearson, who is a uh, 
and an archivist of recordings uh, helped us put that together. In fact, he did all the very meticulous work of hmm. uh, piecing the little Remarkable. parts together and took the uh, most of the clicking from the crack in the record out of it. We're going to hear that later. But we have this afternoon two complete Quiz Kids programs, one with Fred Allen as a guest quiz master, and uh, he's kind of a, a judge, a special judge on the program. And then there's another one where Bing Crosby takes over as chief quizzer, and that's the one we're talking about here. We also have a complete Fred Allen show where the um, the kids, now you're not on that one, but uh, a few others are on, uh, uh, appear in a murder mystery sketch. And then we have uh, a Jack Benny program that came from the uh, Civic Opera House in Chicago, and that's what we're going to lead off with. This is on Mother's Day. It's the 12th of May of 1946, sponsored originally by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. We've uh, deleted the Lucky Strike commercials on this because those quiz kids were too young to smoke anyway, <laughs> and uh, for other historical and uh, current reasons. We have uh, a program from Chicago Civic Opera House with over 3,700 people in the audience. It's a Jack Benny show with uh, all the gang, Mary, Phil, Rochester... Dennis, Don Wilson, and the Quiz Kids. And as part of the, the comedy, and I'm sure you will remember this very well, uh, because you were on this show, you were there, you didn't have to travel for this one, you went down to mm -hmm. the Civic Opera House, they did the uh, Lucky Strike Kids. Jack Benny and his gang were pitted against the Quiz Kids. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I'd like to point out one thing, uh -huh. if it's the show I'm thinking of, uh, this would have been this was Jack Benny's own show, and we mm -hmm. did appear we also as guests, guests right. on their shows, mm -hmm. on it, uh, kind of a reciprocal arrangement. And this was probably a scripted program, as opposed to oh, the sure, Quiz Kids yeah. shows themselves, which were totally unrehearsed and spontaneous. So it might be interesting for your audience to okay. notice the difference. Now, on this show, we have uh, Harvey Bennett Fishman, Joel Kupperman, Ruthie Duskin, and Richard Wexler. Now, before we go into the show, since the title of your book, Ruth, which is published by the Chicago Review Press, is uh, entitled, Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids? Now, we're going to learn all day long whatever happened to Ruth Duskin, mm -hmm. but whatever happened to, um, uh, in, a, in a sentence or two, because we're going to spend some time talking about these people else, elsewhere, whatever happened to Harvey Bennett Fishman? Well, Harv Bennett, as he is now known, is a top Hollywood television producer. He recently won an Emmy for his dramatic show, A Woman Called Golda. Mm -hmm. He also produced the film Star Trek, the second Star Trek film, which was out recently, uh, Six Million Dollar Man, many other top programs. So he's just been lying around doing nothing, right? Since, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, uh, uh, Joel Kupperman? Joel Kupperman is a philosophy professor at a state university on the East Coast. He refused to be interviewed for the book mm -hmm. because he finds his Quiz Kids memories too painful. He doesn't want to talk about them. It's interesting. There are a number of divergent reactions to mm -hmm. the show, and uh, I think that's one of the things that makes my book worth reading and well, interesting you, I to know me. you go into uh, very fine detail on uh, a great many of the uh, Quiz Kid uh, Quiz kids, talking about their feelings as they were a quiz kid and what the, how they've re re reacted to that as they've grown up and what they're doing now, and it's very very interesting. Right, very the, the book does uh, have quite a bit of information about Joel and what mm -hmm. he's doing, but mm -hmm. he did not want to talk to me for publication. Well, where did you get all that dirt? I mean, well, that I'm, I'm a journalist, <laughs> 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 investigative reporter. <laughs> he did write me a nice letter, uh -huh. which is included. An unauthorized. Semi biography of Joel <laughs> Kupperman, <laughs> but he right. really sh he was the shining star of the quiz. Yeah, he's I think. The one. I mean, I know there are a lot of the. You, know, you were on for, uh, as you said, 146 radio appearances, and uh, uh, he really, even that with that, and so many others on so many times. But uh, when everybody, anybody ever says, the quiz kids. Probably the next word is, whatever happened to that little guy, the smart guy with all the math stuff, Joel Kupperman? Oh, yes, you know? Joel Kupperman. Yeah, yeah right. he's the one that everybody remembers yeah, because, right. as Pat Conlon said, Pat was one mm -hmm. of the other quiz kids who was on almost as much as Joel. Both of them were on around 400 mm -hmm. times altogether. Wow. And uh, Pat said Joel Kupperman was the one who summed up what they were selling on that show, the little kid who seemed to be some sort of an incredible genius. Mm -hmm. And that's why people remember him. Okay, now the other quiz kid on this uh, Jack Benny show from 1946 is Richard Wexler. 
Richard Wexler uh, also re- declined to be interviewed. He also was very young when he came on the mm-hmm. show, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of the the reason for the reactions. Uh, people who started as quiz kids at a very young age, which included me, mm-hmm. had some mixed feelings about it. It was not always that easy socially to be a brain in those days mm-hmm. and have a finger pointed at you. And you know, you were kind of kidding in, in what you said at the beginning of the no, show, which I is wasn't. in the foreword <laughs> of my book. But those were the kinds of reactions mm-hmm. that we quiz kids had to deal with day mm-hmm. by day in our normal I, I school lives. That, yeah. And so it wasn't always easy. And I have a feeling maybe that's why Richard didn't want to be interviewed. Mm-hmm. He, uh, I think, is an engineer, and he lives out on the East Coast. Now, you contacted how many people as you were gathering the material for the book? You, you sent out questionnaires, and you contacted... Yes, you first I had reach. to track down yeah. as many of the former quiz mm-hmm. kids as I could, which was a very difficult job because there are no existing lists. Mm-hmm. And I was able to find approximately 140 of, of the quiz kids sent them questionnaires. Um, I did interview a dozen or so of them in depth for Mm -hmm. the book, people who were the most prominent on the uh program. And the others I sent questionnaires to, and I got back about 70, which I was very pleased about. uh And it it was really exciting to get back in touch with these people that I had not seen for 30 or 40 years and to find out what they were really like as people. Not and, just uh, as quiz kids. And so many, most of the 70 are, there, there's a, some mention someplace in the book of what they're doing oh, now. Oh yes, they're uh, all, they're yeah. all mentioned mm-hmm. and I've quoted from their comments and their remarks. And there is a chapter devoted to each of the dozen or so yeah, regulars right. that I interviewed. Good. We're going to talk much more about this as the afternoon rolls on, but we've got to get into some old time radio now. And I can't think of a better combination than the quiz kids and Jack Benny. This is on Mother's Day, May the 12th of 1946. On NBC, it's the Jack Benny program. From the Civic Opera House in Chicago, Illinois, the Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. This is Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. Our guest in the studio this afternoon is Ruth Duskin Feldman, author of Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids. Ruth Feldman, do you remember the first time you went on the Quiz Kids show? Well, I don't know if I have a direct memory of it, but I Mm -hmm. certainly know about it. I uh, was only seven years old. Uh Um, It was about three weeks before Pearl Harbor, November 19, 1941. And I describe it in, in my book as a very... Stormy night. My uh, my mother has a very good memory of it uh-huh. because they thought we were never going to get there on time. Uh, the weather was so bad and we didn't have a car and they were trying to hail a taxi and couldn't find one. We finally got there just shortly before airtime and that was a real squeaker. <laughs> And everybody cheered, and you went on, and you were successful. And Yes, I uh, lasted for three appearances that time, and then came back after not being one of the top three on my third appearance. I came back a few weeks later and went on to become one of the regulars. Were you, you were about the youngest quiz kid at the time, weren't you? At that you? time, yes, I was the youngest mm-hmm. quiz kid, and I was the first little girl that they'd ever had on the show. They'd had some older girls, but never any little girl. So people did make a big fuss about me. <laughs> you, uh, in, in your book, there are uh, uh, quite a few photographs of the uh, appearances on the Quiz Kid and the kids with the celebrities. I know there's a wonderful photo. Of, we just had the Jack Benny show. There's a photo of Jack welcoming a number of the Quiz Kids at the train. Mm-hmm. And I wondered if in the background we heard Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. You know? <laughs> but there's uh, 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 photos of, uh, of many of the kids then and there's a few updated photos in the back where we see the kids are grown now. And, uh, Some of which I took, those photos. That's right, I see. Nice, she's yeah. got her name on the cover, folks. His name is on the cover, name is on the spine, name is on the individual, and she's got the nerve to put <laughs> photo, photo by Ruth Feldman. You well, know, among so. other things, I'm also a photographer as well as a writer. <laughs> Bef- we have a little clip from your first appearance on the Quiz Kids show in 1941. But, you know, we were asking, whatever happened to all of these other Quiz Kids? Now, what what are you doing now? And I know you've spent a 
considerable amount of time in the last couple of years working on this book. Is that the only thing you've been doing? Well, for the past year, I've been spending mm-hmm. pretty much full time on the book. Uh-huh. I did take a few weeks out and wrote the lead article for a magazine called Jewish Chicago about Senator Percy's Mideast record. Mm-hmm. And um, I have done a few other articles and film strip scripts on the side. I do quite a bit of work for audiovisuals, mm-hmm. both mm-hmm. scripts, product design, and photography. And uh, I did work for eight years for Lerner Newspapers as a staff writer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. covering primarily Highland Park, which is where I live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have done a number of freelance magazine articles, and I've even ri- written a marionette show, which has been produced in shopping centers. Yeah. I helped produce a training course for Motorola. And just you name it. I'm, I'm a freelancer. Uh-huh. I do a lot uh-huh. of different kinds of things. And with your husband, Gil, you have raised, uh, produced a nice family, too, haven't you? That's right. You? Three children who are now pretty much grown up. Our youngest is a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. And where does he go to high school? She, she goes to I'm Highland sorry. Park High School. Park, it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza because this weekend she is starring in Man of La Mancha oh, at Highland is, Park huh? High School. Oh, oh. Well, that's we know where you're going to be. Huh? That's right. Tonight yeah. I will be there Tonight for the third be there. performance. Uh, <laughs> but not tomorrow afternoon because tomorrow afternoon you're coming to our Metro Golden Memory Shop in Chicago, right? Right, and I'm looking forward to it. You no, know, we're really excited about having you come by because uh, we have a, uh, a, a good supply of the books, the Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kid book, and you're going to be there, and I hope that you get writer's cramp. <laughs> I hope because, so, too. Uh, I remember be... that well, <laughs> <laughs> incidentally, right. sitting and autographing. Right. That was uh, one of the things that was sometimes a little bit tedious when I was a kid, but I'm looking forward to doing it tomorrow. Well, I hope it won't be tedious. As a matter of fact, a lot of your fans, uh, the fans of the Quiz Kid program, will be happy to come by and uh, to say hello, to meet you, and uh, to get an autograph on the new book. And it really is... It really is hot off the press. I think the ink is just barely dry on these uh, on these copies here because they delivered uh, a uh, several boxes of the books to our shop yesterday, late yesterday afternoon. It was just really under the wire because when we talked about you coming on the show, I said I need enough advance time so we can publish in the newsletter. And of course, you said I know all about advance publishing dates, so let's see what <laughs> we can to talk with the publisher, Chicago Review Press, and said. Uh, they said, well, we can have copies there for you. And they really went the last mile to get those copies uh, to you, I'm believe sure they me. Did. Yeah, well, we appreciate that. That, that truck driver was coming in facing Chicago traffic late at night, <laughs> and I think they opened up the plant early in the morning to receive the books. It oh. was uh, down to the wire, but well, we I, did it. I'm really happy because I, I know I talked to somebody uh, from the publisher on uh, Thursday, I think, and he said, don't worry, we'll have them there. Uh, they'll be there either this afternoon or Friday for sure. And uh, I, I was not at the shop yesterday afternoon, and I, I called in, and I talked to Al Peterson, who was there, and I said, did the, did the books get there yet? I'm anxious, you know, because we're talking about all day, and we want to make sure the books are there. And he said, well, I got a call, and he says, that they said, how late are you open? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, Friday, we're there till he said, till 7.30. said, so, okay, they'll be there by 7.30. So I checked this morning, and they, everything's there all set. So we got a nice fresh stack of the books. Well, now let's take you back, Ruth Duskin, to this sounds like Ralph Edwards and This Is Your Life, right? <laughs> That's right. To Wednesday, because Quiz Kids were on Wednesday in the early days. Now That's I remember right. them a lot from Sundays. Mm-hmm. Most of my listening to them was Sundays, but Wednesday when they first started. Uh, this is November the 19th of 1941. You know, this is almost uh, almost 41 years ago. That's right. Now, it is. My gosh. You don't look it. <laughs> well, you thank don't you, Chuck. Look it. You really don't. Neither do you. I happen to know that we're just about the same age. <laughs> the, well, yes, just about. <laughs> I'm uh, actually I'm a little younger than you. I was born on June the 29th. You were born on June 13th. June 13th. Well, I won't pull seniority. <laughs> okay, she's just. A, I'm just a kid, right? <laughs> November the 19th, 1941. This is the uh, an excerpt from the broadcast of that day, the Quiz Kids Show. This is Ruth Duskin's first appearance on the program on the blue network of the National Broadcasting Company, heard in Chicago over WLS. The sponsor was Alka-Seltzer. The chief quizzer was Joe Kelly. And let's listen to this. Now, this is from a badly broken record. So uh, this this runs only about seven and a half minutes, but uh, most of it has uh, a click in there. But uh, we'll just... uh, uh, the record didn't wear as well as you did, Ruth. But oh, anyway, this is a, a real uh, important thing to have. This is uh, Ruth Duskin's first appearance on the Quiz Kids. Here they are, the Quiz Kids, presented by the makers of Alka-Seltzer and one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets. 
We're on the air with the school kids questionnaire. Welcome, folks, to another Wednesday night with the Quiz Kids. The questions for our Quiz Kid examination are sent in by you listeners and selected for the program by Sidney L. James of Time and Life magazine. Now, the five youngsters sitting here at their desks in Alcatel's classroom of the air haven't the remotest idea of what the questions will be tonight. But they'll soon know because here comes our chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Fort Carson, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, first, let's call the roll of our upperclassmen. The three winners held over from last Wednesday night. Harvey? I'm Harvey Fishman. I'm 11 years old, and I attend Bradwell School. Julia? I'm Julia Marwick. I'm 15 and a junior at New Trier Township High School, Winnetka, Illinois. And David? I'm David Jenkins. I'm 13 years old. I'm in the eighth grade of the Grant White School in Forest Park. And now our newcomers who are challenging the veterans, Dick... I am Richard Bannister from Roy, Illinois. I'm 12 years old, and I am a freshman at the West Aurora High School. And the youngest little lady in Quiz Kids history, Ruth. I'm Ruth Duskin. I'm Ruth Sondra Duskin. I'm seven years old, and I'm in the third grade at the Pope School. <laughs> and now then, uh, Ruth, don't you be afraid of these older kids, because uh, just because you're only seven, <laughs> you just clear your little throat and get ready to shout out the answers. And did you notice, Ruth, just before the Quiz Kids broadcast, Fort Pearson invited all the folks in our studio audience to clear throats and cough and sneeze. <laughs> well, that's so we can get all the static over with before we go on the air. And you know, in the last few weeks, that chorus of coughs and sneezes seemed to register an awful lot heavier. Of course it would, Joe, on account of this is the fall cold season. And that's why I'd like just 25 seconds to repeat those helpful Alka-Seltzer ABCs for relief in cold stress. A. Alka-Seltzer. Take it to ease the misery of that stuffed-up, headachey feeling a cold usually brings. B, be careful. Stay out of chilling grass, get more rest than usual. C, comfort your throat, raw and raspy from the cold, by gargling with Alka-Seltzer. There they are, the simple, sensible Alka-Seltzer ABCs. Remember them. Get Alka-Seltzer at any drugstore and have it handy when a cold strikes. First question coming right up, quiz kid. Here's an opening question that will help you warm up those young brains. It's from Art Van Harvey, who plays the part of Vic on the Vic and Sade radio program. Listen carefully. If you had these coins in your pocket, how much money would you have? One, just one of the smallest dimension coin. Two, of the next largest. Three, of the next largest. And four, of the next largest. Julia? Is that United States money? That's right. Oh. David? Sixty-seven cents. Oh. No. Harvey? Well, would you repeat the figures again, Mr. Kelly? Well, I really shouldn't, but, uh... Well, let's see. Richard has his hand dollar up. $1.27, isn't it? dollar twenty-seven. that's right. <laughs> uh, Dick, tell us how you, uh, arrived at that figure. I'm not... I can't... I don't remember the figures now, but the first one would be a dime. I'm not, not sure how many of each of those they were. Then, then they got pennies, nickels, and quarters. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So many uh, folks would think that the penny was the smallest, see? But it, the dime is the smallest. All right, next question. In the old days in Europe, church and state were closely allied. Harold J. Herbert of Yuba City, California, wants to know what monarchs you associate with these two men of the church. Cardinal Richelieu. Harvey? Well, that was... Uh... Uh, King of France, Louis, um, see, Louis XIV, was it? Well, no, I'm, uh, I'm Louis asking Louis XIV. You... No, sorry. Uh, Julia? Louis the Thirteenth. uh, <laughs> and I think just one year of Louis the Fourteenth reign. No, Richelieu died before Louis the Thirteenth. Uh, well, <laughs> Richelieu died in, uh, 1642, and Louis the Thirteenth died in 1643, then. That's right. That's very, very good. All right, now, how about the next one? Cardinal Wolsey. Uh, Richard? Henry VIII, who had six wives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's uh, a little excerpt of Ruthie's first appearance on the Quiz Kids show from November the 19th of 1941. Now, Ruth, 
you say that you you have heard that and you've heard uh, talk about it, but it's a matter of not specifically remembering that. Of course, well, you I were was just only seven, seven years, years old. old. That's right. Yeah. And there were lots of other things going on mm-hmm. in my young life. This was just, uh, I didn't even realize that I was on the radio, to tell you the truth. Uh, in fact, I think the first time that I realized I was actually on the radio was that I met a little girl down the block, and she said she had heard me. Mm-hmm. And I went home, I was very puzzled, and I said to my mother, well, I didn't see her there in the studio, and... My mother, well, that's when I found out, you know, that people were hearing me who weren't sitting there in the studio. Well, it was was very difficult, I would think, to to try to accept all of that. What they were doing, your folks were taking you to a place where there was an audience and there were other things going on. And And you see, I had had several auditions before Mm -hmm. the first appearance on the show itself uh, to accustom me to the mic. And this was a usual procedure, Uh the new quiz kid uh, candidates were uh-huh. auditioned beforehand to see which ones could really come through on the show. It wasn't enough to be bright. You had to have some stage presence, a good voice, personality, and so on. So they tested you out with auditions. And I think because I was so young, mm-hmm. I was actually six when I started this auditioning uh-huh. process, uh-huh. they, I think, were a little bit nervous, and they kept calling me back for more auditions. And so by the time I came for my first broadcast, I just thought it was another audition. <laughs> what were, uh, do you know, uh, can you tell us what was the motivation on the part of your parents to to uh, get you into this? Was it that they they felt that you were so bright that they just wanted to share their joy with uh, the world? Or did they think that you were... Could have could be better than the other quiz kids, or what was it? What was their motivation in in bringing you into this scene? Well, I think one thing is my mother, who is also a writer, has written an article which has been published called "Praise is a Hunger," and I think uh, she really believes very strongly that people who have abilities should have them recognized. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, there was a little argument between her and my father. He was kind of rather leery of my being on the program. In fact, when she first wrote in to ask for the application, she didn't even tell him. And then when the questionnaire came back that I had to fill out, of course, they did discuss it. And he was a little bit worried. He thought maybe I would get spoiled or that it would interfere with our family life. And she said, first of all, that I would enjoy the game. It was really just like a puzzle or Uh, a puzzle game, uh which I enjoyed always. I loved doing puzzles and word games and things like that. And uh, so she thought it would be fun for me. But in addition to that, she just felt that I could... I deserved the recognition, and uh, I'm sure she kind of enjoyed the recognition herself. Well, she probably enjoyed the the fact that you were there. That was an extension of her interest in these things, too, I suppose. Yes, yes. Now, your specialty on the program, and most of the kids came to the show with some kind of a specialty. Joel Kupperman's was math, and uh, Lon Lundy's was uh, music, and uh, some of the others had different specialties. What was your specialty? Well, originally, my, I had really several specialties, mm-hmm. Shakespeare, the Bible, mythology, Aesop's fables, mainly literature. And then later, after a couple of years, when I was about nine, I became interested in, of all things, chemistry, which was my father's specialty. Mm-hmm. He was a high school chemistry teacher here in Chicago for many, many years and uh, taught at several schools around the Chicago area. And one day, I woke up early in the morning and picked up one of his chemistry textbooks to read and got interested in it, knocked on the bedroom door and (laughs) bursting with questions, interrupted my parents. Mm -hmm. And um, he was very excited that I was so interested in chemistry. So he began bringing home experiments from his high Mm -hmm. school for me to do with him in the kitchen sink. And my mother was always worried that the place was going (laughs) to blow up. And I was constantly nagging him for problems. So chemistry became one of my specialties on the show. And I think one that the uh, Quiz Kids staff welcomed and played out because it was unusual in those days for a, a little girl to be interested in chemistry. And it wasn't taken by anybody else on the show either, was it? No, not it initially. It hadn't been, yeah. Of course, uh, other people began boning up on that periodic <laughs> table <laughs> once well, they knew that I was doing sure. it. Now, now you got so much involved in chemistry that you actually, as a, as a youngster, at about um, 12. Well, 12 or 13, you wrote, you wrote a book. That's right. This was your first book, right? That's right, and, and now I've written my second, second book. <laughs> <laughs> now, that book was called Kemi, Kemi the Magician. Kemi the Magician, yes. It was about a uh, chemist who was doing chemical magic mm-hmm. and lived in a land called Chemistia and fought the forces of black magic. And just at the time that I was finishing the book, the first atomic bomb exploded, so I included a chapter about that. Oh, so you really picked up uh, well on that then. Now, when... The book came out, there was a lot of discussion about that on the Quiz Kids program, so that must have really helped the uh, the sale of the book, too, didn't it? 
I'm not really sure how well the book did as far as sales are concerned. Mm-hmm. That, too, was something that, you know, my parents really didn't want me to be swell-headed, as uh-huh, my father uh-huh. used to put it. So they didn't share much of the publicity with me. In mm-hmm. fact, I didn't see any of it until I was in my teens. And as far as how well the book sold, I really wasn't that interested. I enjoyed writing it, and I was thrilled about seeing it in print. I still mm-hmm. remember the day that I first got that book in the mail from the publisher and how thrilled I was and wrote a long rhapsodic entry in my diary. <laughs> so uh, that was that was what was really important, was the doing of it. Well, I know that on one occasion, at least, the Quiz Kids devoted uh, a segment of the program to an experiment from your book. And we have a little clip of that now. This is about uh, almost six minutes. And this is from the Quiz Kids broadcast of uh, March the 21st of 1948. Now, the question is based on her uh, book, Kemi the Magician, as Ruthie Duskin prepares an experiment. The other kids try to tell why and how it works. So let's listen in now to uh, Ruthie Duskin on the Quiz Kids with uh, a chemistry experiment on March the 21st of 1948. Yeah, I think uh, the person who was saying it wouldn't mean I saw what you saw. <laughs> well, I think you got something there, Ruthie, but in this particular case... Uh, Julia? This might also be declining a verb. I saw, you saw, we, he saw, we saw. No, I'll tell you. You saw is the premier, though he would not be talking double talk. And by the way, uh, according to a newspaper lately, I think I read where you saw is coming here to confer with President Roosevelt. All right, next question. Bert L. Robinson of Los Angeles, California, says he knew a bus driver who always answered his passengers in rhyme. For example, when they said... Uh, drop me at the street named Hewitt, he'd snap back and say, uh, sure, I'll be glad to do it. Uh, get the idea? Well, I want you kids to try it. Uh, you did pretty well a while ago on other people's poetry. Now, here's the first one. <clears throat> Let me off at spring. Now, you've got to supply the rhyming line of that, uh, uh, Ruth. But you'll have to pull the string. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. What do you want to get off some place, uh, uh, Richard? So I can go and get my girl an engagement ring. Oh, oh, fine. That's right. With Christmas around the corner. All right, now, Harvey. Uh, make the little button go ding ling. <laughs> All right, here's the next one, kids. Let me off at Hill. Uh, Ruthie. Uh, because I paid my dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> I fry streetcar. <laughs> Richard? So I can get an Alka-Seltzer pill. That old oh. boy, say! <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> All right, now, here, here's the next one. Let me off at state. Let me off at state. Julia? So I can meet my Kate. <laughs> that's very good. Richard? So I'll be sure to pull the brakes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Harvey? Hurry up. I don't want to wait. Yeah. Uh, Ruth? Um, Let me off the stick. Because I've made a date. Oh, because I've made a date. Oh, because I've made a date. Oh, because I've made a date. Well, say, recess already, quiz kids. Land sakes, you know, you're doing such a good job on these questions tonight, I'll bet your teachers won't give you any homework all week. <laughs> Henrietta Long of Seattle, Washington, thought of this question after she had read Quiz Kid Ruthie Duskin's exciting story about Kemi the Magician. And since the question is in the form of chemistry experiments, I've asked Ruthie to perform the experiments right here, and you kids are to explain them. Are you all ready, Ruthie? Sure, Mr. Kelly. All right, fine. Uh, Ruthie calls this experiment the barking dog trick. She has arranged several tall cylinders of different sizes and placed filter paper over each one. She has poured a solution of white phosphorus in carbon bisulfide on the paper. The filter paper should burst into flame. It will pretty soon now. Yeah, it'll be ready in a few more seconds. All right, fine. And then we'll listen for the barking dog after that, see? Are you sure it's going to work, Ruthie? Well, it should. Well, don't get too close to it now. (laughs) There There it goes. goes. There it is. That was it. The one... Oh, there. Another dog. Here comes another one. Don't go away, anybody. <laughs> all right. That's all right. I wish I 
I have some windshield wipers on my glasses here. Uh, all right, now then, uh, uh, the question is, what? Uh, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Joel? Well, with the phosphorus and the other thing, uh, shouldn't the atmosphere sort of be uh, ignited and... When the air touches the paper, it should burst into flame. That's on the right track. I don't think you quite have the exact idea of it, but it's pretty near. But uh, David, what was the phosphorus on? Uh, was it on top of the paper or in the in the uh, tube? Well, this is filter paper. I pour it on. Some of it remains on top, and some of it goes into the tube. What about that, David? Well, uh, what was the chemical kind of carbon like by sulfite or sulfate? Sorry. Sulfide. Sulfide. Okay. Bisulfite, carbon bisulfite. Joe? Well, aren't they both inflammable? So they in, uh, sort of uh, rise in the shape of gas, maybe, and when they touch the paper, the paper bursts into flame? Uh, I, I don't think he quite has it exactly. Well, I mean, let's see. David has his idea. hand up again. Well, uh, I, I think it's, uh, when, the, when the two combine, it's, uh, the carbon bisulfite uh, changes to uh, free, free carbon, which burns... Uh, in the flame. Well, this, this isn't a compound. It's, a, it's just a solution. They don't combine at all. No, they don't, see. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't. Now, Ruthie, we know. <laughs> well, we, uh, evidently, uh, we give up on this, or, or are we going to try again at it? Uh, uh, David? Well, I think the car myself, I decomposes into... Uh, uh. <laughs> no. No. No, Joel? Well, isn't the air... Uh, don't they sort of ignite the air because they're inflammable, and when the rise of the air touches the paper, it bursts into flame? Well, well Joel does have the right idea, but yeah. it's not the, it's not, I mean, he doesn't know it exactly. Not exactly, no, see? And, uh, David? Well, you put the, uh, you put the, uh, the, uh, carbon bisulfate on top of the, uh, phosphorus. Pour it on. Oh, oh, you mean the, uh, it's just a solution, you dissolve it. Yeah, yeah but it was poured on top of it. It was poured on top of the phosphorus. Well, it's dissolved together. Yeah, it's all mixed, see. Ruby, <laughs> uh, really, shall we tell them? Yeah, no, not well, yet. Uh, not when, yet. when you uh, put the phosphorus and carbon disulfide solution onto the filter paper, part of it goes through and vaporizes and mixes with the air. Part of it remains on top, and the carbon disulfide that remains on top evaporates, leaving the phosphorus, which is inflammable at room temperature, so it bursts into flame and ignites the, the mixture in the cylinder. Ruby, you're right. You're Let's, uh, let's, let's try this next experiment. Now, for this next one, Ruthie will start a fire with water. All right, now, here we go. Uh, Ruthie is uh, piling up a little mound of zinc dust and ammonium nitrate. And now she is making a crater in the top of the mound. See? Now then, she's dropping a few drops of water on top of the whole thing. Let's see what happens. Watch out now. Stand back. There we are. There she goes. The whole pile is starting to smoke. Now, where are you, kids? <laughs> can you, uh, can you quiz kids explain what took place, David? So, uh, uh, there was water that was, uh... The what? The water was poured on, on, uh, top of the, uh, the zinc and the ammonium nitrate. But the, uh, the zinc just acts as a catalyst, and the ammonium nitrate just uh, bursts burst into flame when it, get, when it gets in contact with the water. How about that, Ruthie? Well, it isn't the zinc that acts as the catalyst. Uh-huh. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to have to give up. There's the bell. That means that that's a miss. It was a lot of fun, though, and thanks a lot, Ruthie. And that also means that Henry Andy Long of Seattle, Washington, received one of the big $250 Zenith Radio Phonograph combinations for stopping the kids again. Well, as usual, the old bell means class is over for today. The judges are already busy totaling up the scores, and they'll have your report cards ready in just a minute. Okay, that's an excerpt from the Quiz Kiss. That's uh, the experiment that uh, Ruthie Duskin conducted on the broadcast of March the 21st of 1948. And if you're listening very closely, you heard you heard actually about a minute of the preceding excerpt. We kind of pulled out of that early, and we shouldn't have, so you, you got a little of that. You got more for your money this time on those were the days. Ruth Duskin Feldman is with us in the studio this afternoon. Ruth, what did you do after this with the your interest in chemistry? Well, actually not a great deal. I uh, did take chemistry in high school. And in fact, I used my father's workbook. My father wrote a chemistry workbook. And uh, later uh, I did, uh, for a very brief period of time, uh, a couple of months, I taught 
high school science at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, to soldiers and um, soldiers who were getting their GED completion. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I was constantly calling my father up, frantic phone calls every night to have a little bit of help with the next day's experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so chemistry played a little special part of your life too then, didn't it? Yes, okay. but I, I went on to other interests also. Well, we've got a real surprise coming up in just a couple of minutes on Those Were the Days, so stick around and don't touch that dial. This is Chuck Shaden. You're tuned to WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. We're going to be tuning in to more Quiz Kids programs. In fact, we have a broadcast from New York from March the 28th of 1943 coming up next. And then we have, uh, on that show, by the way, Fred Allen is the guest. And then after that, we have a Fred Allen show with the Quiz Kids as their guest and all more and more and more of the Quiz Kids. We're going to have lots of fun, so stick around. This is Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. Our guest in the studio is Ruth Duskin Feldman, author of a brand new book titled Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids, published by the Chicago Review Press. Ruth Duskin, whatever happened to a very uh, uh, famous quiz kid, uh, a quiz kid who had the name of Smila Brind. 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 Smila Brind. Well, she became... She was not very famous as Smila Brind, was <laughs> no, she? No, except on the Quiz Kids program. Uh-huh. She became Vanessa Brown, the very well-known movie, stage, and television star. She uh, starred in The Seven Year Itch on Broadway for mm-hmm. a couple of years, in My Favorite Husband on Television with Barry Nelson, and also appeared in many, many movies, something like 20 movies, including The Bad and the Beautiful, the Late George Apley, mm-hmm. many others. Well, she also I, was Jane in Tarzan. <laughs> and with uh, Lex, um, Lex, it, Barker, Lex Barker right, as Tarzan, uh-huh. right. Well, guess who we have on the line right now? We're going out to Hollywood, California, and on the line is Miss Vanessa Brown. Hello, Vanessa. Hello. Hello. We're Hello. Waiting. Hello, Vanessa. I can't hear nothing. Now, now you've got us now, haven't you? What? I can hear you now. Okay, we're all set now. I think we finally have the hookup, and I'm sorry for the uh, the problem here. This is Chuck Shaden from Those Were the Days in Chicago. Our guest in our studio here is Ruth Duskin, a friend of yours who wrote a very interesting book about the quiz kids. Yeah. And you were one of the quiz kids, right? Yes, and Ruthie's been a friend for a long time. When did, when did you first appear on the quiz kids program? It was in the 40s. I was in a play called Watch on the Rhine, and we played Chicago, and they asked the general manager who he would like to have uh, represent the show, and I got picked by the general manager, and I went on the show. And you remember appearing on the program? Yes, because it was a very distinctive uh, period in my life, and it was a very distinctive group of uh, kids, and and Joe Kelly, and Miss Hickok, and all the people that, uh, you know, worked the show. It was a very... I wanted to be on it. Uh, for a long time anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ruth, were you on the uh, show at the same time Vanessa was? Around the same period. In fact, uh, I believe, uh, Vanessa or Smila, uh, I believe you may remember that when you were in New York and were called to appear on the Quiz Kids program, I was there on a trip and had a cough or asthma attack and couldn't be on, and so uh, Smila was called on in my place. And so we were... Uh, compatriots, so to speak. We were on the show around the same time. Oh, I'd forgotten that. Right. I think we may have been on one together, we too. We were. We did, right. we did at least one, if not two, together. Yes, I think so. I can't imagine the Quiz Kids would have two raving beauties on one <laughs> show. That was wonderful. She was younger, and I was jealous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she was an actress, and I wanted to be one. <laughs> Vanessa, you appeared on Broadway in The Seven Year Itch. So and glad you mentioned my big triumph. <laughs> oh, that was uh, hey, that's a very important uh, role for you. It uh, it just uh, that was. Would you say that was the beginning of the the uh, the uh, really the high points of your life? Well, let's put it this way: it was the pinnacle. <laughs> and uh, I mean, as far as my acting career goes, mm-hmm. I never really topped anything beyond that. And I, and that was about the best thing that could happen to an actress at that time. Well, you you. Uh, were brought to Hollywood following that, correct? No, I was in Hollywood before, and I had gone back and forth for about two years, mm-hmm. uh, hoping to land a good show in New York, and I was doing television, live television in New York, and, uh, you know, various kinds of promotion and publicity and talk shows, and and then uh, that year, I was offered four, four different scripts. Uh, Liebling Wood offered me a script, and uh, Miriam Howell, and anyway, of the four, I liked this one the best because I like the part the best. And I got it. 
Were you were you disappointed that uh, they chose that that other person to do that in the movie? I can't think of. Well, it Marilyn, Marilyn, <laughs> uh, I tell you, no, not really, because uh, we had tried to buy it, my husband's company, uh-huh. and had they gone for a star man like Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart, as the negotiations were going on, then I would have played it, regardless of who made the film. But when uh, Axelrod wanted desperately to work with Billy Wilder. Mm-hmm. That kind of set the die because Wilder wanted Monroe. I see. So that was it. So it didn't. It didn't really uh, mean that much to me. I mean, it was would have been nice, but I never thought of it as a reality that I would get to play it in the movie. But you, you and uh, Marilyn were friends, weren't you? Yes, yes. I knew Marilyn when she first came to Fox, and I kind of tried to help her because she was very uh, innocent and and she, she she didn't look stupid exactly, but she didn't know where she was going. And uh, there was a dance class, and I remember Marilyn coming in, and she wanted to know if she could uh, look in and if she could be a part of this dance class. And I said, sure, this is a contract class, and you can come, you know. And a couple of times helping her along, she was very, very fresh and very unsure of herself. And she was very sweet. I liked her. Mm-hmm. You you uh, became a cover girl as well, though. Your, your picture in... Uh, uh some of the nicest looking uh, bathing suits I've ever seen were on the cover of um, a number of uh, major publications, weren't they? Yes. Well, first of all, 20th Century Fox, when I was under contract to them, put on a major campaign, uh, and the department at that time was very well endowed with people, and they launched me. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, when Seven Year Itch hit, uh, I was on everything you could think of in one week. All in one week? Practically. I mean, Life, Cosmopolitan, Q, you name it. It was really scary. You walk down uh, Sixth Avenue, you know, and all the newsstands are all in red and black, red and black, red and black, and they're all Vanessa Brown. <laughs> <laughs> well, you went on to uh, have some successful things to do in television as well as the films, didn't you? Yes. After that, I tell you, my, my career uh, took a turn. For one thing, uh, my personal life changed, and when I came back to Hollywood, I did a series called My Favorite Husband. Mm-hmm. Um, which I took over from Joan Caulfield, who in turn had taken it over from Lucille Ball. And um, then I did some uh, episodic television, Wagon Train, Loretta Young, and various things like that. And uh, then I met Mark, and uh, on our second date he said, uh, I will never marry an actress, that's for sure. <laughs> so I said very diplomatically, quite right. <laughs> and uh, so then I started to turn stuff down and... You know, there was a matinee theater I was supposed to do with Boris Segal. I had failed to show up at rehearsal, and I remember the conversation with Segal. And he said, oh, come on, come on. And I said, no, I can't. I can't go down there. And I'd never done that before. So um, when Mark and I were married, I really turned down stuff, thinking that he really didn't want to marry an actress, you know. And uh, and then I applied the... I mean, I want to, you know, jump, because when Kathy... My first one was about to be born. I realized that I had to do something, so I applied to Murrow, who was head of Voice of America, Ed, Edward R. Murrow. Edward R. Murrow, yes. And I applied to do a series for them, and then worked for them for ten years. Well, you certainly haven't been inactive, and all the smarts that you uh, displayed as a uh, as a quiz kid, of course, have uh, done you proud during your entire uh, career. Because I know you've uh, you've been involved in a great many things, but you did return to acting a little bit, didn't you? A few years ago, I think you were in a uh, in the Norman Lear series, uh, All That Glitters. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Every so often, somebody sees me somewhere, and they 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 offer me a script, and if the money is good, and I have the time, and it, everything else is equal, then I'm happy because I like acting. It's not my main thrust, though. Did you enjoy being one of the quiz kids for the very time? Very much. Did you? Very much. I liked the kids very much. They were, to me, a group of equals. And uh, as I toured around the country in the several plays that I was in, I would see them in different places. I visited Ruthie on the campus at Northwestern University, mm-hmm. where she was uh, taking journalism. And uh, I, Richard Williams, I saw him uh, in Cambridge. Uh, I mean, we were playing Boston. And uh, Claude Brenner showed up later, and, uh, and uh, I was doing a a tryout of my husband's play, Ben Franklin, in Paris, and I saw Claude in out in Cambridge area. And so you always run into somebody. Harvey Bennett was our neighbor down the street uh, up until he just moved. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really uh, 
nice, a nice company to, to be part of. Well, I think it's a rather exclusive group. And I think you should be proud to be part of it. Thank you. I, I, I am. I am. And uh, what I, I don't know if Ruthie told you, but I'm involved now in some videotapes of careers for uh, kids as well as re-entrance into the workforce. Mm -hmm. A series called well, What Do You Want to Be Tomorrow? And uh, I guess of what I learned from the kids, uh, plus my own uh, development as a person, is uh, spurring me on to try to find that other kids have the same opportunity that I had and that I would like to help them with in these tapes. Well, we thank you for your uh, participation as a quiz kid and as also as a... Uh uh, a human being and all the things that you're doing. Ruth, is uh, her copy of her book on the way to her? Yes, it is. I wish that you had it already, but it will be on the way very shortly, and I hope you'll like it. I want to help you in any way I can in Los Angeles. i got a lot of friends in the media. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Vanessa Brown. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. That was Vanessa Brown, a former quiz kid by the name of uh, Smila Brind. Right. right, got it. Got that's, it right that's this a, time. That's a tough name. Now, so you're a quick study. Oh Chuck. yeah. <laughs> See, I could have been one of those that's quiz right. kids. There. Uh, I, you have it phonetically in in the book, uh -huh. and she, you mentioned in your book that uh, her name was kind of a, just a juggling together of a bunch of. Yeah, she said her father put some letters together and Smila came out. Yeah. <laughs> she also said at one point that he didn't want to have a daughter like any other daughter, and I don't think he did. <laughs> probably not. He probably had some alphabet noodles in the chicken soup there, and that's what uh, right. that's what happened. My name is Chuck Shade, and this is our Those Were the Days program from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. Our studio guest is Ruth Duskin Feldman, author of a brand new book, Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids, published by the Chicago Review Press. That book is uh, so brand new that there's only one place that you can get it now, although I know the distribution will be widespread within the next couple of weeks, I suppose, in the Chicago area. Oh, right? yes, I hope so. It better be. <laughs> it should but be you, in, in all the bookstores. Yeah. But we've got yeah. copies at the Metro Golden Memory Shop, and uh, Ruth is going to be there tomorrow afternoon from noon until 4, and she'll be more than happy to autograph copies of the book, won't you? I certainly will. Yeah. And you can autograph a few yourself. You know, you're modestly forgetting to mention that you wrote the foreword to my book. I was very pleased to have been invited by Ruth to uh, to write the foreword to the book, and uh, I'll be glad to sign my name. I probably can't spell very well, but uh, I'll be glad to, glad <laughs> to do You think you that. remember the C in Shaden? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, as most people leave out the C in Shaden. C-S-H-A-D-E-N, I don't know how that is. We're going to be joined by another quiz kid in just a couple of minutes. Lonnie Lundy is in our studio this afternoon, one of the famous quiz kids from the days of not so long ago. And we'll have some fun with Lon, too. So stick around. This is Chuck Shaden on our Those Were the Days salute to the quiz kids from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. We're in the studio with Ruth Duskin Feldman. And joining Ruthie Duskin and Chucky Shaden is Lonnie <laughs> Lundy. Lon, welcome to our Those Were the Days program. Thank you, Chuck. I'm happy you invited me. It's uh, good to be here. Well, it's nice to have you with us. I know we spoke on the phone once uh, on right. the air, I think, and reminisced a little bit about the quiz kids. But now, believe it or not, you are a chapter in a book. Chapter in a book, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just seeing the book for the first time. It's, uh, I think I can already say I recommend it to anyone who's out there listening. It looks like a, a real winner. I didn't well, see thanks you. for the plug, Lon. <laughs> I didn't see you doing any uh, editing with the uh, felt tip pen on the <laughs> chapter that says Lon right. Lundy. So uh, he's uh, going through it. Lon, when was your first appearance on the Quiz Kids? Uh, it was in 1944. I was uh, eight years old at the time. Mm -hmm. In 1944. And how long were you on the show? Well, the show went off the air uh, shortly before I would have had to retire because of old age. 16, Namely, right? my 16th birthday, right? <laughs> so that would have been 1951. I think uh, my last appearance was probably about the summer of 51. Uh -huh. Let me interject yeah. that that was not the last gasp of the quiz kids. It was off the air temporarily, went back on, both on radio and television, and lasted through 1953. So still went on uh, a while. You did, Lon, did you ever get on television with it? Oh, yes. You were yes. on TV a uh, fair amount. You, I, and Ruth's book says that you were on 235 times. Uh, no, that's information that uh, my father has. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure it's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're a, uh, a Chicago area person, aren't you? Strictly you a Chicago area, yes. Grew up in uh, Park Ridge. Right. And now you live in... Uh, Des Plaines. Des Plaines, uh-huh. 
and Ruth is Highland Park, right? That's right. So we've got the suburban ring around the city all covered here. As a matter of fact, the way we first got reacquainted a couple of years ago, I happened to open up a suburban newspaper and noticed that someone named Lon Lundy was playing at the Ark in Glenview. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I wonder if that's the same person. I had known him as Lonnie, of course. How long is it since you've been called Lonnie? Uh, really, I uh, stopped. Uh, or I stopped About being Lonnie <laughs> uh, when I was a, a freshman in college. Right. Uh, I well, anyway, that as a college kid, uh, Lon is a little better than Lonnie. Anyway, I wondered if it was the same person, and I went and heard him play, and was very impressed. Enjoyed it tremendously. I'm not sure. At what point did you recognize me in the audience? Well, first of all, I, I remember the, the night you were there. I had been on vacation. I believe uh, we had just come back from Jamaica, and my first night back, uh, somebody had said that you had been in there looking for me. and uh, uh, While you were gone, yes. I was unhappy to find that uh, somebody was there in my place. And uh, uh, whoever it was that told me said that uh, you'd, you had said you'd be back pretty soon. So I, uh, kind of out of the corner of my mind, I was looking for you. But when did you recognize me? That's oh, right. I don't know. How long did it I, take you? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Oh, you kids. <laughs> Lon is a pianist and a composer, and we're going to talk more with Lon Lundy and with uh, Ruth Duskin. But we've got another Quiz Kids show to play, or we've got actually our first Quiz Kids show to play for you here. I think we're running a little tighter. We better get rolling on all of this stuff. It's so much fun talking with you folks, yet we do have a lot of the, the tapes of these things to play. This is a, a show from New York now. On March the 28th of 1943, on this show, we have Joel Kupperman, who is uh, six years old. We have Harvey Bennett Fishman, who is 12 years old. We have Vanessa Brown, Smila Brind. 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 Oh, see, I wasn't supposed to <laughs> quit study. Already. She was 15 at this time. And um, Richard Williams was 13, and Gerald Darrow was 10 on this Gerard, show. Gerard Darrow. Gerard, Gerard Darrow. Okay. You don't mind oh, my correct No, me. I don't mind. You're the, you're the experts. Yeah, I told you these quiz kids always show you up <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and the guest on this show is uh, Fred Allen. So let's have some fun as we go back to New York in 1943 for the quiz kids. We're on the air with the School Kids Questionnaire, presented by the makers of Alka-Seltzer and One-A-Day brand vitamin tablets. And here they are in New York City, the Quiz Kids and their special guest, Fred Allen. Lon Lundy is in the studio with us, and we're talking with uh, Lon and Ruth about the good old days of the Quiz Kids. And Ruth, tell us about the, uh, the other two panelists on this particular broadcast, uh, Richard Williams and uh, Gerard Darrow. Well, Richard Williams was uh, the first American consul in China in 30 years when the United States recognized China um, mm. after that three decades of uh, no, no diplomatic relations. Richard was sent over there as the consul in Canton, and he established the first diplomatic post there. Now he is deputy consul general in Hong Kong. And Gerard, uh, Gerard is the most tragic story in my book. There's a chapter devoted mm -hmm. to him. He's no longer living. He died a couple of years ago. He was in broken health. He was an alcoholic. He'd been on welfare. Uh, Gerard was, I think even at the time he was on the show, he, he showed some signs of trouble. And uh, some of us were not surprised when we read in Studs Terkel's book an interview with him under an assumed name. And... Uh, at that time, he was a greenhouse attendant. He'd spent some years mm -hmm. as a classical disc jockey, but then had kind of gone down, downhill, a uh, number of menial jobs. And um, it was not surprising. As I went around the country interviewing the other quiz kids, they all said, what happened to Gerard? And everybody was kind of concerned about him. So it's, it's the most tragic story in the book. Well, as a, as a quiz kid, what, what kind of sign did you get? Did you, you know, you say, well, you thought, we thought that something... Well, was not you, you know, know I, I mentioned well before that my father was worried about my being on the show because uh -huh. he was afraid mm -hmm. I'd be spoiled. Uh, when you put a young child on a national network show like this and he gets all this adulation, there is a certain amount of danger, and, and the family has to be very careful how they handle it, mm -hmm. and maybe it depends on the child and, and his own personality, how it affects him. In Gerard's case, he was the first famous Quiz Kid baby. He was on the very first Quiz Kids program. He was the youngest. He got tremendous, tremendous public acclaim mm -hmm. and publicity. He was on the cover of Life at the age of mm -hmm. seven years old, mm -hmm. and uh, it may have it may have gone to his head. He was actually dropped from the show when he was 11, 
And he told Studs Terkel that he thought it was because he had become pretty obnoxious. I don't know if that was really the reason, but that's what he thought was the mm-hmm. reason, apparently. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it was not easy for him to face that letdown at the age of 11, being a has-been. So there are probably a number of reasons. And, you know, if people are interested, they can read more in my book about his story because I've gone into it in some depth. It's a fascinating book. It's entitled, Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids, Perils and Profits of Growing Up Gifted. And it's by Ruth Duskin Feldman, published by Chicago Review Press. It's twelve ninety five in hardcover. It's a beautiful book. It's uh, available now at our Metro Golden Memory Shop in Chicago. And Ruth will be there tomorrow afternoon, all afternoon from noon until 4, to autograph your copy. And you might enjoy uh, meeting her in person. She's a charming lady. And uh, she'll, uh, she'll be happy to smile at you and, uh, and say hello and sign her book. Ruth, now, how long was it between... The last time you saw Lon on a Quiz Kids program until now as you were doing the research for your book. It's probably about 30 years. He graduated in 1951. Actually, we were on the Northwestern University campus at the same time, but he never looked me up, and I didn't know he was there, so I didn't see him how for could, about 30 years. How could you not look her up, Lon? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have a, I do know one thing. She was involved in a kind of a, what, what would you call it, a, a quiz show. And the college quiz bowl. The college quiz bowl, that was it. And I remember thinking that if, if I did contact her, somehow or another, against my wishes, I might get dragged into that kind of thing. Uh-huh. I really didn't want any part of that. So he had an ulterior motive. <laughs> was Ruth a rope renter type? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> How did you, Ruth, find Lon? After all those years now. Well, as I mentioned, I had seen uh, an item in a suburban newspaper that someone named Lon Lundy was playing at a piano bar Mm -hmm. in Glenview, the Ark. And I remembered that Lon had been a musical prodigy on the show. In fact, uh, he at the age of four, sat down at the piano, like bo- almost like Mozart, and was playing with both hands on black and white keys within a week. He's too modest to tell you about all this, so that's why I'm doing it for him. <laughs> at any rate, and he was uh, composing at a very early age. So when I saw that Lon Lundy was playing piano mm-hmm. at a bar, I sort of put two and two together. I figured maybe he was still playing the piano. And I went and, and listened to him, and mm-hmm. he was. Now, you, you've, uh, Lon, you've played at the... Uh the Ark in Glenview, and you've, been, you've actually played many places all around the, uh, the area, haven't you? Uh, extensively around the northwest uh, side and the and, uh, north shore, and also downtown to some extent. Mm-hmm. In, in Ruth's book, she mentions that you have a, uh, a tremendous recall of, the, of what I consider to be the great songs of uh, the good old days, the good songs, the stuff that, that lasts, and the, when someone says... Uh, how about this song or that song? You can knock that off real fast, right? Right. I seem to uh, be able to call back tunes that uh, I really haven't given a thought to for 20 years. I'm, uh, In general, I don't have a very good memory, but uh, for songs, I do. That's and, really interesting uh, you know, for you to say, Lon, because on the show he had a fantastic memory. <laughs> but that's one of the things I found out, not only from my own experience, but from the other former quiz kids. Most of them say, unfortunately, memory does decline with the years mm-hmm. if you don't use it. There was one exception, somebody who said that he was in a field where he really had to use his memory, and so he thinks it's better than ever. Lon, besides music, what was your specialty on the show? Uh, I would say sports <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, was a big specialty, especially uh, baseball and football. Uh, aside from that, well, I, I gave Ruth no competition on chemistry or <laughs> Shakespeare, I'm sure of that. But uh, in general, I, uh, I think I followed uh-huh. current events uh-huh. uh, reasonably well. And I don't know, I, I used to kind of consider myself uh, well, liable to answer almost anything except uh, Math or chemistry or Shakespeare. Did most of, most of the quiz kids try to keep up on current events pretty much? Were they, was that a, almost a, a, a prerequisite? I think it was a prerequisite for anyone who was going to be on any great length of time mm-hmm. because, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of enjoy listening to the shows uh, nowadays and kind of analyzing the, the, the questions, what, mm-hmm. how they would put the show together as far as types of questions. Now, for every kid, they would probably be at least one question that was almost aimed at them, right into their specialty. But the rest mm-hmm. uh, were really up for grabs, and it, uh, whichever kids had read the newspaper and done a little more reading on uh, various subjects than the other kids would be the ones who were going to be successful on the show. Now, you see, this is where what it really amazes me, because 
you, you were, what, how old were you when you got on the show? Uh, eight for eight, the first time. Eight years old. All right, eight or nine years old, you were reading the newspapers and, you know, reading the things that were happening in the world and the nation and locally and all of that sort of thing. And I went, you know, at eight years old, I wasn't reading the newspaper for that stuff. I, I mean, I just... Bringing up father, you know, I was looking at Maggie and Jigs and the Blondie. Well, I think, <laughs> I think we were looking at that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at least you, you did it all, see. That's why I hated you folks so much. <laughs> I really don't hate you. In fact, I admire you very much for all of the, for, for your, your, your talent and your ability and, um, and for being part of, uh, uh, of a real, real bit of American-style entertainment. Lon, the show we're going to play next is a Fred Allen broadcast from 1947, and you were on the uh, you were among the quiz kids who were on the show. They mentioned you as a, a new quiz kid. Do you remember this that particular broadcast? I remember the broadcast, yes. Now, how did how did uh, how did it feel to be working on a on a real major nighttime radio show with a big gun like Fred Allen? Well, I I certainly enjoyed it. I remember that. Uh, like the one you played earlier. Now, this mm. was not a quiz kid show. This was a Fred Allen show. There mm. there was a script involved in rehearsals. And uh, as I recall, uh, the, they definitely wanted to, me to play and sing one of my own songs. And I think uh, two or three times during the week, uh, they had a slightly different idea of what, what song they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think they changed the, the script of this uh little drama that the uh, quiz kids put on on the show a couple of times they it wound up being a murder mystery uh well i'll say no more because uh, i'm sure everyone <laughs> listening well we've be, got it yeah it's, a, it's kind of a good one i i really enjoyed that show and i really enjoyed fred allen Incidentally, yeah. a mm -hmm. minor uh, factual thing, but I wonder if he really was a new quiz kid at that point it seems to me you'd been i wasn't I, I had never been with fred allen before Oh, I see. That's why. That's where they got to right. as a, as a new quiz. Because he'd already been on the show a couple of years, I think. Yes. Okay. Just a half a second uh, before we get into it. Naomi Cooks and Jack Rooney are on this show. W Ruth Duskin Feldman. What are you're telling us in your fantastic book? Whatever happened to the quiz kids? Whatever happened to Naomi Cooks? Naomi Cooks is a. Uh, she lives in San Francisco. She spent 20 years teaching English literature at San Francisco City College, and just within the past year or so, she's gone into a new venture, a business, a pop art boutique called Think Big, which sells huge pencils and all sorts of other oversized items. And there's a photo of her in the book too. Yes, right. posing with her with oversized, her oversized pencil. Huge pencil. And what about Jack Rooney? Jack Rooney is a law professor at Michigan State. Boy, oh boy, this kid knows them all. She's, you ought to be on a quiz show sometime. <laughs> I should try it. Let's, uh, well, we have, in, in just a moment, we're going back to 1947 for the Fred Allen Show. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is Those Were the Days from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. Now, gang, let's go back to March the 2nd of 1947 for the Fred Allen Show. And here's the Fred Allen Show, presented by the makers of Shepherd Cheese and Tenderleaf Tea. And while Fred Allen is pinning on his town marshal's badge for his trip down Allen's Alley, let's talk a moment about Shepherd Cheese. Now, you folks, of course, had um, a great contact with the chief quizzer, Joe Kelly. Right. Now, Ruth, uh, earlier in our program, you were talking about how, he, how Joe Kelly came to, uh, to be on the show, how he got his job. What kind of a relationship was there between, well, generally, Joe Kelly and the kids, and specifically between yourself and Joe Kelly? Well, he was a warm, fatherly kind of person, and uh, really the same way off the mic that he was on the mic. He used to kid around with us, play the piano before the show during the warm-up period, mm -hmm. tell jokes, and just really made us feel very much at ease. Pat Conlon, particularly, one of the former Quiz Kids who I interviewed in the book, talked about how important his relationship with Joe Kelly was in his own life, that Joe Kelly was one of the people that made him really feel that he was interested in Pat as a person and not just mm -hmm. somebody out there answering questions. And I think that pretty much says it for most of us. Lon, did uh, Joe Kelly make you feel at ease and comfortable? Oh, I think he made everyone feel at ease. Uh, the thing that uh, I remember the most is that uh, on a couple of occasions where he was ill for extended periods of time, uh, other quiz masters were tried out, some of them very prominent entertainers and people with real mic presence and uh, people who had a good way with kids, but it uh, it was never the same. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe was just uh, 
Mr. Quizmaster. He was just ideal for the, the show. Now, he was on uh, basically for the complete radio run of the series. Is that right? right? And also on television. The only uh, exception was, uh, aside from the occasional fill-ins that mm-hmm, Lon mentioned, mm-hmm. the show was revived in 1956 very briefly in New York. Not the same show at all. Mm-hmm. Um, the original show had been, as we've said, a Chicago-based network show. And uh, Lou Cowan, the originator of the program, did start a new Quiz Kids version in New York in 1956 with Clifton Fadiman as MC. Mm-hmm. Much more erudite, brilliant man who totally bombed. (laughs) He just didn't have the kind of feeling for the kids. And as one of the reviews said, Larry Walters reviewed him in the Tribune here in Chicago and said he knew all the answers. And so, you know, the kids didn't really. Right. Exactly. Well, Fadiman was on Information Please on radio for for many years. And uh, he was, uh, you know, accustomed to dealing with uh, very intelligent uh, adult panelists. And uh, I... I remember seeing a couple of the quiz kids on TV with Fadiman, and it just really wasn't the same. It just, mm-hmm. uh, and some people would compare the quiz kids with Juvenile Jury. And, of course, that was a whole different kind of a thing, too, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, Juvenile Jury was a group of kids, who, a panel, who were asked questions like, at what age should a girl start wearing lipstick? Or um, do you and just think... just getting opinions then from right, the Right, right, curfews, things uh-huh. like that. And um, I, I think uh, the kids came over sometimes as a little bit smart-alecky, mm-hmm. whereas the quiz kids were encouraged to be modest and, uh, you know, apple pie motherhood kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but I think uh, Juvenile Jury never in the ratings or, or otherwise uh, reached the spot that the Quiz Kids had mm-hmm. in, in America's heart. I might add that on most Quiz Kids shows, not all but most, there would be perhaps one question that was not a, a real question and answer situation, but uh, a la juvenile jury mm-hmm. asking mm-hmm. Uh, uh, for advice on some problems such as Ruth just quoted. And I, uh, I remember as a kid thinking that that detracted from our show. You uh, felt a lot, you'd of, rather lot of them say with just the never came off very well the uh, the way they were intended, and I I think it would have been better to stick with the questions. Did uh, to get back to Joe Kelly for just a half a minute? Did did you you know we've read in your book Ruth and and I've heard too in other things uh, Dunning's book talks uh, has just a short section on on the uh, on the quiz kids, and they always bring up the fact that Joe Kelly had a third grade education and that uh, the kids basically were smarter than he was and. Uh, and he had to be prompted a lot by the production staff. And uh, if he didn't have the material on the card, it was really sometimes lost with some things. But everyone will agree, I think, that the show was made because of Joe Kelly. He was the, right. the, the force that brought it all together. Now, as a youngster on the program, did either of you ever have the feeling that you were smarter than Joe Kelly? No. <laughs> did, you, did you feel that way? No, not at all. I don't remember really thinking about that. I, I know now that Joe Kelly was a lot smarter than he pretended to be. Uh-huh, you know, he taught uh-huh. himself to play the piano by watching a demonstration in a dime store. Uh, and he, he had quite a bit on the ball. He uh-huh. just didn't have the education. So you real thought of him as the adult on the show? He was the leader and you just did it right. that way. Uh, he did I don't job, know he whether well. the general listening audience thought that he wasn't all that bright either. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that uh, this was the show, and uh, and he was human, and we, you know, as I mentioned much earlier in the show, you know, if he if he made a little mistake or something, he was, uh, we were easy to identify with that. Yeah, although, uh, Roby Hickok, who was hired to coach Joe on mm-hmm. the answers to the questions, had some really rough moments, which I describe in my book. For example, when uh, we were, they were touring in Richmond, um, and they had been going to museums and whatever mm-hmm. about the Confederacy, and they were just about to go on the air with the show and Joe Kelly leaned over to Roby who was sitting next to him and said now who did win the Civil War? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> oh boy. Well we have one more Quiz Kids program coming up uh, with Bing Crosby as a chief quizzer uh, along with Joe Kelly. You're going to hear him and on this show Ruth sings a duet with Bing Crosby. That's or tries to. <laughs> tries to sing a duet with Bing Crosby. This program coming up in a minute or two is, uh, has been restored from a series of broken discs by our pal Carl Pearson. And there's a little bit of a problem in the first five to eight minutes of the show, but it, it is not that bad. And uh, Carl mentioned to me that it took 52 separate splices to, to recreate this program on tape mm. after all of the clicks and the pops and everything else in there. So, And it was a, a work of love for him, and I think it's a... Uh, 
uh, it's a wonderful program, and you're going to enjoy it. So we'll get to the Quiz Kids in just one moment. Chuck Shaden here on Those Were the Days from WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. Guests in the studio, Ruth Duskin Feldman, who wrote Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids, and Lon Lundy, one of the Quiz Kids. Whatever Happened to Lon Lundy? He's here this afternoon on Those Were the Days. Now, let's go back to May the 16th of 1943 as Elka Seltzer presents on the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company, The Quiz Kids. We're on the air with the School Kids Questionnaire presented by the makers of Elka Seltzer and One A Day brand vitamin tablets. And here they are, The Quiz Kids with Bing Crosby. Yes, Quiz Kids, a noted gentleman by the name of Bing Crosby will play teacher during the second session of our examination tonight. Now, as always, the program is made up of questions sent in by you listeners. And for each question we use on the broadcast, the makers of Alka-Seltzer will send you a Zenith portable radio. Now, these Quiz Kids use up a lot of questions, so keep on sending them in. The address is simply Quiz Kids, Chicago. We may reword your questions, and we are sole judges in case similar questions come in. And now, here is our chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Gerwood Kirby, and good evening, everyone. Well, we've got so many important things on the schedule tonight, let's get right down to business. It's roll call. Claude? My name is Claude Brenner. I'm 14 years old and a junior at Lake Forest Academy. Robert? My name is Robert Anver. I'm 11 years old and in 7A at Bateman School. Ruthie? I'm Ruthie Duskin. I'm eight years old, and I'm in fifth grade at Parkside. Gerard? I'm Gerard Gerard. I'm ten years old, and I'm in sixth grade at Bradwell School. Richard? I'm Richard Williams. I'm 13 years old, and in the eighth grade at Roosevelt School, East Chicago, Indiana. And Harry? When the blue, when the blue of the night meets the gold of the night. Yes, that was Harry Lewis Crosby, the gentleman known as Bing. Bing was in Chicago for the observance of I Am an American Day, sponsored by the war-saving staff of the United States Treasury and the Chicago Herald American. While he was here in town, Bing decided to pay the quiz kid to visit. And, of course, we decided to put him on the spot. So, Dr. Crosby, dean of old KMH, will take over my cap, gown, and teacher's chair during the second session of school tonight. And during the first half, Joe, I'll just sort of kibitz around here and see how you operate, huh? Oh, you won't have any trouble, Bing. After all, they're just little children, you know. Yes, I see, but uh, one of them's a little girl. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right, Bing. You've got a polo team at your house, that's haven't right. you? <laughs> that's oh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, before school begins, here's Derwood Kirby. He's only one-fourth the father you are, Bing, because Derwood has only one boy while you have four. But he also has 99 words of wisdom for all you folks with children. Right, Joe. You know, all youngsters require and deserve a world of understanding and patient attention. But sometimes I know you parents find patience a little hard to manage, especially on those occasional off days when a headache or a touch of acid indigestion makes you feel just a bit touchy and irritable. Well, that's why it's such a good idea to keep a package of Alka-Seltzer in your home. Because Alka-Seltzer eases up those little discomforts quickly and pleasantly. Just drink down a sparkling glass of Alka-Seltzer and see how soon you feel like your own cheerful self again. All right, Joe, let's see what the quiz kids know. Hmm? All right. Well, children, your first question tonight from Vivian Chenoweth of Los Angeles, California, is an easy Bible question. At least it's easy after you get the answer. What two characters in the Bible were never born? I'm talking now about human characters, not the Trinity. Gerard? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, that's right, Gerard. Good for you. (laughs) Harold Wall of Portland, Oregon, points out an amazing fact. There are as many cities of over a million population in Japan as there are in the United States. Our cities that big are New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Los Angeles. What five cities in Japan also have over a million population? Let's try to get at least three out of five. Ruthie? Well, I'll take a yes at Tokyo. Well, Tokyo, that's one, Ruthie. Good girl, yeah. Richard? Uh, I think Yokohama and uh, Kobe. Uh, and wait Osaka. a minute, uh, you're wrong on uh, Yokohama. That's out. Osaka. And that's Kobe. another one. Kobe. And uh, Nagoya. 
That's right. That's all I know. Well, that's very, very good, children. Very good. All right, here's a true or false question from Lloyd H. McMorrin of uh, Piedmont, California. Is it true or false? A 17-year locust actually requires about 17 years to reach maturity. Richard? I think that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, in the six, about 16 years in the north, and it's uh, less than that, about 15 in the south. Well, uh, let's see. We have some more hands up here. Uh, Gerard? Well, anywhere it, it takes 17 years. Anywhere, but there's uh, one... It's, uh, I don't know where it's from, but it sometimes takes 13 years. You see, it buries itself in the ground, and after 17 years, it, it forms, and then after about 17 years, it comes out a fully grown locust. Well, that, that's uh, a well, production. Yeah. You always should say so, yeah. <laughs> You're right, Bing. Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Richard was off about two years insofar as the South is concerned. But in the north, it lacks about two or three weeks of uh, uh, full 17 years to reach complete development. By the way, Dr. Crosby, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, scientific name for that is the periodical cicada. You knew that, didn't you? Clever, clever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, now then, uh, is it true or false? Bing Crosby is a well-dressed man. <laughs> Ruthie? Sorry, uh, trouble, Ruthie. Well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ruthie, uh, did you want to answer that? Um, oh, well, <laughs> I would <wouldn't> say. <laughs> well, go right ahead. Um, well, I think it's true. <laughs> you think it's true? How about you? Uh, being nice. <laughs> very, very politic, this young man. Yeah. Uh, Claude? Well, I wouldn't mind having that jacket he's wearing. Oh. <laughs> Hey, if you if you pay for it, you can have it. <laughs> Let's see what Gerard has to say. Oh, I think he is because he wore some pretty fancy things on the road to Morocco. Yeah, uh, to, well, the only touch of class in the picture was my wardrobe. Oh. Uh, well, I knew uh, you children were polite, but I think you carried it too far this time. <laughs> oh, that's all. Yeah. Glad to see you, Joe. <laughs> all right, stick around, I'll be. All right. <laughs> Following the African victory, President Roosevelt sent a cablegram extending congratulations to General Eisenhower and other commanding officers. Mr. H.P. Henderson of Atlanta, Georgia, wants to know who received congratulations as commander of all Allied ground forces in Africa. Claude? Lieutenant General Kenneth Arthur Noel Anderson. Well... That's a nice name there, Claude, but uh, it isn't really... Oh, the uh, one... then, uh, is it Alexander? He's, well, now, uh, is it? I think it is. That's right. Well, your thinking's working all right. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, B British General Sir Harold Alexander. He's the commander of all Allied ground forces in Africa. All right? As commander of the Allied Air Forces. Robert. I think that was General Patton. No. No. Commander. Uh, all right, Richard. I think it was Tedder. Tedder. That's right. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. British. As commander of all Allied naval forces. Who was that to you? Commander of all Allied naval forces. Well, Bing, your kids would uh, know that one, wouldn't they? Naturally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall I tell you, children? You give up? Admiral Sir Andrew B. Cunningham, commander of the Mediterranean Fleet Operations for the Allies. Well, you got two of them. That's all right. We can't get them all. Esther Roberts of Washington, D.C. says that if you ever feel sorry for yourself, you should think about the hard life of some comic strip children. Why would you hate to change places with little orphan Annie? Ruthie? Well, uh, she was an orphan, and uh, she, uh, well, she didn't have uh, any home much of the time, and sometimes she was getting in trouble, and... Uh, I think there was uh, one story about her as a commando, and uh, naturally they uh, they suffer a lot and they go through a lot. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Very good, Ruthie. Very good. All right, Richard. And besides that, uh, the way that she's drawn, she looks like she's blind because there are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that's true, Richard. 
Uh, how about K.O. Mullen? All right, Richard. Well, uh, he, he always seems to uh, wear ragged clothes and things like that. Besides that, he's awfully small. Yes. Uh, anything else? <laughs> well, uh, his Uncle Willie and his Aunt Mamie are always fighting, <laughs> and so are uh, Lord Plush, Lord and Lady Plushbottom. Uh-huh. Uh, Gerard? Well, uh, there's one thing very dangerous about that. He's usually sitting on the edge of a, pan a piano or something like that, and he's always breaking vases and getting into trouble. Yeah. And uh, when he sits on the edge of a piano, I think he's going to fall off any minute. <laughs> yes, well, that's uh, possible. Robert? Well, on average, if he gets in the comic strip, he gets spanked one of every four times. Uh, yeah, that's true. Where does he sleep, by the way? <laughs> Richard? He sleeps in a dresser drawer. That's right. <laughs> yeah, very good, kids. All right, now, you know, it's evening here, but it's uh, breakfast time in Chongqing, China, and also in Professor Kirby's elocution class. Say, those waffles are swell, honey. I'd wait for another one, but I'm late now. So long, dear. Oh, no, you don't. You're going to dash out without your one-a-day tablet. So what? Here it is springtime, practically summer. I won't catch any colds now. Well, don't be too sure. Well, where do you get the idea that you don't need A and D vitamins in summer? Do you think the sunshine can creep through those brick walls in your factory? No, I suppose it can't at that. I don't want you to let your resistance get low any time of the year. Well, I guess you're right, honey. Anyway, it's no trouble to take one-a-day tablets. Just one little tablet at breakfast, and presto, I've got my daily rations of vitamins A and D. Well, goodbye again. Good day, sir. And don't forget your one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets again. Into that single tablet are packed a whole normal day's supply of A and D vitamins, or maybe you know them as the cod liver oil vitamins. Remember, one-a-days are the vitamin tablets that are so rich in A and D vitamins, you take just a single tablet once a day. Well, that once-a-day idea makes for convenience these busy days. And it makes for real money saving, too. Instead of paying for three or four tablets or capsules a day, you pay for just one. So remember that brand name. It's One A Day brand, made by Miles Laboratories. All right, Mr. Kelly, isn't it about time to turn over the class to Professor Crosby? It certainly is, Derwood. Dr. Crosby of old KMH will now preside over the Alka Seltzer classroom of the air. Bing, old boy, just slide yourself behind the desk there right. and uh, pitch up the questions. Fine, but you got to let me borrow that, uh, that stale hat there, that mortar board. <laughs> Do I look a little like Professor Kaiser now? Oh, yes. You know, there's a lot of talent in that hat, Ben. That right? Yeah, Fred Allen Ward, Jack Betty, and Tallulah Bankhead. And oh, I'm in a fast, fast league here, then. Of course, I must, uh, might add here, usually our professors wear their shirts tucked inside, Bing. Oh, but that's all right. That's all right. All right. Yeah, go right ahead. All I right. take the first question, yeah. huh? Mm -hmm. Do I have to face this battery of, of brains here with these questions? Miss uh, Elizabeth Patterson of Seattle, Washington, kids, she points out that uh, twins have played important roles in history. Now she wants you to identify these famous sets of twins and tell where they're found. First, uh, Castor and Pollux. Look at the hands go up. <laughs> Ruthie, you want to handle uh, that? Um, that's, that's from mythology, and those were uh, two brothers. I believe they were uh, half mortal and half immortal, and they were the brothers of uh, Helen, who is the most beautiful woman in the world, and, uh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I think that ought to get as far as I, you want to venture something on that, Claude? You want to enlarge? Well, uh, uh, Hit me. two stars, huh? <laughs> two stars in the sky have been named after them. What are the, what are the names of the stars, Claude? Castor and Paula. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly very interesting. <laughs> I think we got a pretty good answer on that. We've got that covered completely. Now let's go into uh, Sigmund and uh, Siglinda. Ruthie, well, you're the only uh, one that knows that? <laughs> uh, they, they were from uh, Wagner's opera. Um, let's see. It was, I think... You think uh, something from it? Give us a few areas. No, uh, no. Huh? But anyhow, it was uh, it was a, one of the Wagnerian operas, the... Uh, uh, I think it was the Rhine Gold. I think so. And uh, Sigmund uh, uh, mar married uh, Siglinda uh, by stealing her 
Oh, let's not get into that. <laughs> I think that's a great answer, Ruthie. I'm going to pass on that. That's uh, very enlightening. But go think, to... uh, mm-hmm. Pardon me, Dr. Crosby. You still think it was uh, Rheingold, eh? Oh, no, it wasn't Rheingold. I didn't want to say anything. Oh, I see. I... <laughs> Anybody know what opera that was from? Claude? Richard? Robert? Gerard? Joe, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let Ruthie... Ruthie I'm... knows, huh? Um, I think it was the Valkyrie. That's right. That's... <clears throat> It was the Valkyrie. Yeah. <laughs> How about, there's another set of twins, Philip Lang and Dennis Michael. You know that, Gerard? Those are your two boys. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they are two of the famous California gangbusters, <laughs> otherwise known as the Gentile Marx Brothers. <laughs> Well, we go to the next question now here. Uh, Janet Knight of Los Angeles, California. She doesn't think it's too bad for radio comedians to borrow one another's jokes or lift something now and then from Joe Miller's joke book. If Bob Hope thinks that's the book he wrote, I don't know. <laughs> After all, some of the finest classical writers have borrowed shamelessly. And a long time ago, somebody noted that not everything that glistened was gold. You kids named three different writers who borrowed that same idea, almost the same words. Ruthie? Well, uh, You're being it was, uh, tonight, huh? <laughs> it was from, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Pinafore, and, uh, uh, let's see. Then there's an Easter no. Fable. Can't oh. handle that Pinafore. Uh, no, uh, there's an Easter Fable with that, pa- uh, with that, uh, that, uh, moral. I mean, I don't know anything else. How about I'm, you? I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive that it's from, uh, the HMS Pinafore. That's a great stab, but I think you're wrong. <laughs> How about you, Claude, Richard? I think it was, uh, it was in uh, Shakespeare. I'm not sure which book. Well, what I want you to give me is uh, variations on the expression of uh, everything that glistened was gold. Oh, and well, uh, some writers who, uh, who, who took that one liberty. The, made one the was, uh, I think, all is not all that glistens is not gold, and all is not gold that glisters. That's good. That's that's right. Gerard, you want to take a crack? Well, I know that uh, it is from Pinafore because there's a song called Things Are Seldom What They See. <laughs> and there's a line that what says, song? All that glistens is not gold. Is that in Pinafore? That's right. Yes. Well, I don't deny that, but I want you to give me some variations on that and tell me what writers made that, uh, took the liberty of, of making variations on that quotation. Maybe it was in Pinafore. I haven't sung Pinafore in years. <laughs> <laughs> What is it, Ruthie? Well, Gilbert and Sullivan is a writer of Pinafore, so uh, Gilbert and Sullivan are the writers of Pinafore, so they must be the ones that did it. <laughs> you want to say a few words in here, Joe? Get me oh, out of this. Well, I, I just, uh, I'll go over in the corner and pick up that egg. I just, I just wanted to say, uh, are Gilbert and Sullivan writing for Pinafore? Yeah, they wrote Pinafore, yes, I know that. <laughs> Well, has anybody got any other uh, writers besides Gil- Gilbert and Sullivan that said all that not glistens is gold and different words? Said substantially the same thing. The gist of that, but in different phraseology. <laughs> nice going, Doctor. What? I think one uh, said all that glitters is not gold. All that glitters is not gold? That's right. That's a good one. Ruthie, you're hot with that's one? What, uh, that's from Shakespeare's mention of Venice. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is a talented girl. I want you in all my pictures. <laughs> well, well, we've got to get along here now with the rest of the questions. Well, wait, uh, mm-hmm. just uh, just a minute there, Bing, before mm-hmm. you go on to the next question on your list. Yeah. I've got a math question I've been carrying around in my pocket for a couple of weeks. I think the kids could handle it all right. Uh, some of them have gone through analytical geometry already, but I wasn't sure I could read the problem just right, see? Mm-hmm. But you mind asking enough? You're used to big words. I've heard you on your craft music hall show many times, and yeah. you use a lot of dollar and a half words. In fact, three dollar words. Done that, done yeah. that. Yeah. Well, see what you can do with this. Well, uh, Robert Bentley of the University of Chicago, I think I'm being trapped here, describes this <laughs> as a very simple problem in analytical geometry. The distance from the origin to the orthogonal projection of a vertex of an equilateral hyperbola upon one of its... Oh, interesting. <laughs> Asymptotes is 12. <laughs> How long is the semiconjugate axis? <laughs> Holy tomatoes, is it? Who wrote this? You got the answer for that and I can't even read it. You got the answer for that. I'm leaving the room immediately. <laughs> How long is the semi-conjugate axis? Uh, Richard? 
Well, uh, in an equilateral hyperbola. Yeah. Oh, that would be 12 times the square root of 2. Naturally. Very good. Because uh, in an equilateral hyperbola, the semi transverse axis is equal to the semi uh, conjugate axis. Oh, yes, it's bad all over the country. <laughs> And the uh, asymptotes are at an angle of 45 degrees with the uh, with those axes, and uh, th so that means that uh, the projection, the orthogonal projection, means perpendicular projection. And so that no, I want of, of the call. vertex <laughs> on the uh, asymptote forms a 45 degree right triangle. And one leg of that is 12, mm -hmm. so that means that uh, the hypotenuse is the semi-transverse axis, and so that would be the square root of 288, or 12 times the square root of 2, and that's the same thing as the semi-conjugate axis. <laughs> Thank you all. That's a, that's a fairly bright boy. Oh, I should say so. You know, is it true that every question used on this show gets a radio? That's right, Bing. Well, Joe, I, you know, I had a little fire out to my house, burned up all the radios and everything. Yeah, I read about that, Bing. Uh, yeah. What, uh, what started that fire? Well, it's, I think what really started is Bob Hope sneaked in the house and rubbed a couple of my sport coats together. Oh, I thought maybe uh, the start was being overworked or something. Yeah. Carrying matches. Yeah, carrying matches. But you do get a radio if the, if, you, if the question is used. Oh, right? absolutely. Well, I've got a question I want to ask the, ask the uh, quiz kid. All right, go right ahead, Bing. Tell me, what is generally meant by the expression, kid? This hurts me worse than it does you. Robert? Well, generally, when I'm getting whipped, my dad says, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think they'd get it. <laughs> Well, this is, uh, that's right. I get the radio. Oh, right? you get the radio. <laughs> you made sure of that, Bing. Sure. <laughs> so here's, a, here's another question. Quotation from uh, Mrs. Helen Murphy of Chicago. She wants to know who made this statement in a recent motion, motion picture. The statement is, uh, why ask me? I'm no quiz kid. Oh, they all got there. What picture, Sam? I have missed Gerard. Gerard! Uh, I think Bob Hope said that in the road to Morocco. Oh, uh, you did. I said it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Bing. Uh, let's give the quiz kids a breather while Mr. Kirby gives let's out. Let's give me a breather. <laughs> Take over, Durward. All right, Joe. It's a suggestion for these days when you mothers have to figure the family meals in points. If you're not careful, you may be skimping on those important B-complex vitamins. And naturally, you don't want to do that because a B-complex deficiency can actually cause such things as nervousness, loss of pep, and poor digestion. Now, here's one simple way to sidestep that possibility of B vitamin deficiency. Give every member of your family a single one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablet every day. Just one little tablet once a day. Now, that's easy, isn't it? You see, each one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablet contains the full minimum daily supply of vitamins B1 and B2, in addition to generous amounts of other vitamins of the B complex. Now, actually, one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablets are so rich in B vitamins just a tablet a day is all you take. And that's exactly why one-a-days are so low in cost. You see, you pay for just one tablet a day, not three or four. So ask any druggist for one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablets. One-a-day is the registered trademark of the Miles Laboratories. And you'll know for sure that you have this high-potency, low-cost brand when you see the big one on the package. Now, uh, Professor Crosby, we're waiting for that next question. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right, Kirby. Uh, Larry Jackson of Kansas City, Missouri group. He wants to know. He's, a, he's an admirer of Victor Herbert. He wants you to listen to these three songs and tell from what uh, operettas they were taken. Here's the first one. Well, uh, Joe, isn't somebody supposed to sing this? Oh, yes, Bing. We'd planned on Lawrence Tibbet, but as long as you're here, why should we pay anybody? Well, Tibbet... <laughs> Of course, I'm unaccustomed to this kind of thing, public singing. <clears throat> For I'm falling in love with someone. Richard? I think uh, the Indian love song. Indian love? <laughs> Ruthie? I'm, I'm falling in love with someone from Naughty Marietta. That's right, by Victor Herbert. Wonderful. <laughs> I 
That sounded like any love call to you, huh, Richard? I <laughs> 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 sung it beautifully. Um, how about this one? Want to know what operetta it's from? Slumber on, my little gypsy sweetheart. Come on, men. We can't let Ruthie get all. Richard, you want to try it again? I think that's... What's the name of the operetta? I... Oh, skip that. Pass. <laughs> Ruthie, what's the it from? Gypsy Love Song from the Fortune Teller. Right, right. <laughs> How about this one? Oh, sweet mystery of life, at last I've found you. Ruthie knows all the songs these boys <laughs> Claude? Is that from the New Moon? No, that's by Romberg, Sigmund oh. Romberg. Well, uh, Ruthie, what's that I from? Sweet Mystery of Life from Naughty Marietta. That's right, thank you. Ruthie! Listen, you must be very musical to know all these operettas. How about you and I singing a little duet? Hmm? <laughs> Let's sing, uh, what would you like? Let's sing All Sweet Mystery of Life? Let's get it in my key, though, huh, Ruthie? <laughs> well, I'll try to. It might be a little higher, though. Oh, you, you start it, and I'll, I'll, sing, I'll sing contralto. Or no, no, you sing with me. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> About a little harmony. Let's get. We want to get mellow, don't we? You sing it. Well, I'll climb in there somewhere. No. Go ahead, Ruthie. Ready? No, oh, yes, yes. sweet mystery of life. At last, I fall. Take the lead, Ruthie. You're not coming through. You're not delivering. Want to try it again? No. Oh, sweet mystery. Get your breath. Take a big deep breath. Breathe, breathe. You must breathe, breathe. Oh, sweet mystery. That's from the new moon, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. What goes on now, Joe? Well, Bing, now our judges get busy adding up scores to see which three quiz kids get another chance in the classroom next week. I and while that's going on... How would you like to give each quiz kid a $100 denomination war bond? Oh, boy, there's nothing I'd rather give out, Joe. Because those war bonds are the stuff that will keep the U.S. the kind of place we all want our kids to grow up in. So you take swell kids like these quiz kids here. They couldn't possibly grow into such splendid children in a fascist country. They'd be too busy learning to hate, to bother with culture or baseball. They wouldn't be allowed to read the books they wanted or listen to a lot of good music. They wouldn't be allowed to study the Bible. But they could answer questions like that first one we had tonight. Yeah, we've got a lot of important things to protect, and that's why war bonds are the best kind of presents that we parents can give our kids. Thank you, Bing. And now, I'll, here are the report cards, and you can give out the news. Oh, yes. Well, here's what it says. The quiz kids as a class missed one question. Sensational performance. I think it must be the way I led them along in my... I um, think so, too. And the winners were Richard was first, Ruthie second, Gerard showed. <laughs> in other words, that means you three quiz kids will come back next week, and with you in the classroom will be Ann Llewellyn, age 11, of Chicago, and Bill Nesbitt, age 12, of Chicago. Well, say, Bing, mm -hmm. it was great to have you visit us. And I know it was a big thrill for the quiz kids to have Bing Crosby for a teacher. Well, I certainly had a lot of fun being here, Joe, and meeting these wonderful children. I think I'll go right home and drop my kids in the claiming race. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing children and very, very nice children to meet and know. Well, thank you very much. So long, Bing. Come see us again. Friends, this is Joe Kelly dismissing the quiz kids class until the same time next Sunday. Good night, kids. Good, Good night, night, Mr. Mr. Kelly. Kelly. Listen to the Quiz Kids every Sunday. Bing Crosby appeared on the Quiz Kids program through the courtesy of the Kraft Cheese Company. This is Derwood Kirby speaking. This program came to you from Chicago. This is the Blue Network. W-E-N-R, the voice of service in Chicago. W-E-N-R in Chicago. Back on May the 16th of 1943, the Quiz Kids with Bing Crosby. And, of course, Ruthie Duskin was there singing a duet with Bing or trying to get through our sweet mystery of life. Huh? At last I found you. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Ruth, uh, that was a, a good show, and uh, this has been a good show. I've been really enjoyed having you with us uh, on the air this afternoon. I've enjoyed it, too, and I appreciate you having me. Lon Lundy, thank you very much for stopping in this afternoon. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Good enjoyed luck, it a lot. Good luck to you, too. And... Uh, 
Ruth, uh, I know that uh, this show will probably be responsible for selling out the first uh, uh, printing of uh, your fantastic book, Whatever Happened to the Quiz Kids. We've just touched very, very briefly on on uh, whatever happened to, but in your book you cover so many of the quiz kids in uh, in depth, too. I mean, there's 20, 25 pages on some of these folks and telling all about them, how they started, what they were doing, what they're doing now. And uh, you did a wonderful job with that. And thank you for bringing back uh, the Quiz Kids for us and so many good memories. Thank you, Chuck. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon at uh, 12 o'clock till 4 at our Metro Golden Memory Shop where you're going to get writer's cramp, I think, (laughs) signing copies of the book. Fine with me. Good enough. Thanks for coming.